seems like that uh, Christmas is right around the corner. I mean, it is on us quick. We were out yesterday doing some shopping, and needless to say, it was madness. Trying to find a parking spot and um, trying to get everybody to get out of my way um, while I'm driving through the parking lot and Monica's big suburban. Um, but uh, just craziness all around and just people packed everywhere. And uh, luckily where we were at shopping, there was a place for the men to sit down and relax uh, while the ladies went and did their shopping. And so that's where I spent uh, most of the afternoon doing that. But Christmas is just coming so fast. In fact, I don't know about you, but it seems like this year has flown by for me. I mean, it, it is just like, boom, I can remember what I was preaching back in January. It just has gone by so quick. Now, some people who are older than me um, tell me that the older you get, the faster the years go. And uh, if that's the case, I just need to get off this ride because uh, it's like the tilt a world. I don't know if you've ever rode the tilt a world. Uh, I, every time I ever rode the tilt a world, I got sick. And um, so if, if, if life's going to get much faster than this, if the years are going to go by much faster, uh, I just need to, to take a chill pill or something and get off. But um, I do want to remind you about our Christmas Eve service or our candlelight service um, simply because uh, it, is, it is an opportunity, a conscious effort that we make to, to have an opportunity for you to invite folks that you may have invited before and they just say no, or maybe people you've been praying about inviting and this is just the perfect opportunity at Christmas time to invite somebody to come. That's why we're having two services. Not because I want to hear Matt sing twice or, or you know, anything like that. Or Now, maybe because we want to eat twice. Maybe that's part of it. But um, it's because we'll have room, we'll have space for you to invite as many people as you want to come. And so I really want to encourage you uh, to do that for next Sunday at 5 and at, and at 7. Um, and it'll be a great time. The, nur- the, sta- the nursery will be staffed, have great food. It's going to be a great, great service. Um, so I hope you can be here for, for part of that. I think one of the th- awarenesses I have come to this Christmas season more than any before is just this idea, and I've said it so many these first couple of weeks of the series, you probably know where I'm going, is that, that this just isn't the best time of year for everybody. And I know, and maybe I've lived in a bubble or lived in a shell or lived in denial or lived in, in whatever to just always think in my mind, hey, it's Christmas. Everybody's happy. Everybody's cheerful. Everybody's upbeat. Everybody's grinning. Everything's going great. But the reality that I'm coming across the more and more I talk to people is that it really isn't for a lot of folks. I told you last week about the conversation I had with the lady at our medical clinic, and um, because she because she's had a child die early, um, and now she she has a child who goes off for two weeks to visit with her dad. She's just like, I wish we could just get through Christmas, just like skip it, and get into January, and get into a new year. This week on Facebook, one of my Facebook friends were were were, were putting some comments on there, and and I was like confused and baffled and like man i can't believe this person feels this way but it was just some very discouraging comments and you know they were just very i guess depressed and and those kinds of things and to be honest with you i don't always understand where somebody is because for some of these folks that i've come across i haven't walked in their shoes i haven't walked down that same road and so when someone looks at me at this christmas season and says well it just isn't the best time of year and i just wish it could go by and i just wish we could get through sometimes i can't relate to that but i'm finding out more and more that it really is a reality for a lot of folks so the whole point of this whole Christmas series that we're doing is just the very fact that hope has come alive. And so maybe you're here today, and, and, and we won't have you raise your hand, but maybe in your heart you're saying and you're screaming, yeah, that's me. I wish Christmas was over. I wish we could just get into the new year. I, I just wish, you know, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that. It just isn't the best time in my life. It just isn't the best time of the season of the year. I want you to know that hope is alive for you. That hope has come alive, and and that's what we celebrate at this Christmas season. We certainly live in a world that has gotten everything turned upside down when it comes to Christmas. 
We live in a country where, well, right now in our country, there is turmoil after turmoil. There, there is scandal after scandal. There, there's all sorts of stuff. I, I wrote down here, we, we live in a country right now where the good guys are seen as bad and the bad guys are seen as good. And, and we're living in a world today where, where um, we're finding out that even our own government has been deceiving us. Like, like it isn't like fiction anymore. It isn't like a John Grisham novel anymore. It's like we're finding out, man, this stuff is real. This stuff is happening. We see our national debt continue to grow, and that may be okay for me because I'll be dead and gone before they even think about paying for it. But for our children and grandchildren, we're leaving a debt that not even Dave Ramsey's going to be able to take care of. I'm not sure how big that debt snowball would be, but it's huge. But, but we live in this world where everything is crazy. But get this. You live in the best country in the world. So as bad as things are, as upside down as things are, as backwards as everything are, we still live in the best country in the world. Now I don't know if that says more about us or the world, but the reality is that is what we are living in. And so the whole point of this is that, yes, we live in a crazy world. We, we live in a place upside down. We live in a place where we're getting it all backwards, where we're living in a place and, and trying to live. If you're trying to live as a believer, you're flowing against the grain. You're swimming upstream against culture and media and everything that's coming to you and at you. And we live in all of that. And the reality is, though, hope has come alive. You don't have to live a hopeless helpless life hope has come alive the first week of the series we looked at the words of the the prophet Isaiah and we looked at the reality that there were 365 specific prophecies made everywhere from where he would be born his lineage what he would do how he would live how he would die all of these prophecies were made 365 of them and they were fulfilled in one person that person of Jesus Christ this Messiah the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah because they were spending a lot of time in captivity and slavery because of their unfaithfulness to God and so when they heard about the Messiah they all got excited now they didn't realize it would take seven eight hundred years after they hear about it for the baby to be born for the Messiah to be born and be delivered but they were always looking for this physical delivery get us out of this physical bondage they never looked for a spiritual savior they always were looking for someone to get them out of their physical bondage that they were in. Last week we looked at the parents, at Joseph and Mary, and, and we saw in Mary's words where she said specifically, I am your servant. And Joseph didn't say those words, but when he awoke from that dream, he did everything as the Lord had commanded. And he did it to the fullest. He did it to the T. He didn't do it halfway. Both of them served the Lord, served God in this endeavor to bring the Messiah into the world, even in the face of earthly humiliation. Even in the face of what would be an earthly scandal, what would be those, those people looking at them thinking, well, have they, did they, did she cheat on him? What's the story here? What's going on? He needs to dump her. I mean, just all of this earthly scandal that was going to take place. But they were put in this position to fulfill an eternal perspective. And that is to bring the Messiah into the world. Now today we want to continue by looking at the words of the angels and we find this story in Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. Uh, there will be back up on the screen. If you have a new version, it's already loaded in there for you. But Luke chapter 2, ver picking up in verse 1, let me just read these verses to you. It says, And at that time Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census, census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taking when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, that was one of the prophecies uh, that had to be fulfilled, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. 
And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her child, a son. She wrapped him, in snug, in, in, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That was another prophecy. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but, but, but the angel reassured them, Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, uh, of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heavens, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen, all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. We see three things here in this passage about the angels and about the words that the angels bring to these shepherds. The first thing that we see is that there is good news because the Messiah was sent for all. In verse 10 and 11, it, 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 it reads this way. It says, And the angel reassured them, Do not be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Messiah was sent to all. Now you need to, you need to understand and realize that first of all, this message was sent to the shepherds. In that day and in that culture, the, the shepherds were among the lowest of the hierarchy of people. They weren't a judge. They weren't a religious leader. They weren't a, you know, any of that uh, that would be high esteem. They had a very important job to do. But just on the scale of folks in that day and in that culture, it would have been one of the lower jobs to have. And so Jesus, uh, the angel didn't come to the king and announce it. He didn't come to the crowd and announce it. He came to the lowest, the poorest, the weakest per se, to bring the message that the Messiah was sent for all. And here's what's great news. The Jewish people for centuries had heard about the Messiah that was coming. All of these prophecies that had been made by Zechariah and, and, and Isaiah and Daniel and, and all these prophecies that had been made over the years and years and years. And in 400 years of silence where nothing was said from God to the people. But the Jewish people were always looking for the Messiah. And the cool thing about this is he doesn't say, hey, the Messiah has come for the Jewish people. And here's why you need to know that that's important, because had he said that, you and I would be out of luck. Most of us. I don't think anybody in here is Jewish. But most of us, we would be out of luck. And so the fact that the Messiah was sent, but not only sent for the Jewish people, but for every one of us, is important today. And that is great news. All of these prophecies that were fulfilled from his lineage of David, from where he would be born, where he would be laying, how he would live, how he would grow up, what his final end would be, his crucifixion and, and his death. All of that was prophesied and all of that was fulfilled when this baby was born. The Messiah was sent for all. He was sent for every nation, not just our country. 
He was sent for every race, not just whatever race you are. He was sent for every gender. He was sent for every age. He was sent for the poor. He was sent for the rich. He was sent for the smart. He was sent for the not so smart. He was sent for all. And that includes you, and that includes your neighbor, and that includes your coworker, and that includes your family, and that includes the people that are around you doing life with you day in and day out. He was sent for us. And that is incredible news for us today. Not only that, we see in verse 13 that praise is better when done together. Praise is better when done together. Verse 13 says, this angel came and delivered this message and then suddenly he was joined with a vast host of others. Can you just imagine the scene for the shepherds? I mean, you got to realize they're out in the, uh, I mean, there wasn't much light. The only light out there would have been light from the stars. So it's a pretty dark place. So when the one angel shows up, it's one thing. It's probably a little odd, something you may put in your notes for the day. But when there's a vast of army of, of angels show up, it's probably mind-blowing. Probably their jaws just dropped. And they showed up and they began to praise God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth to those with whom God's well pleased. Here, here's a, there, there's a difference. I know you guys may not believe this. But there's a huge difference in the worship in my shower in the morning and the worship I get to experience here with you guys. Now, the volume may be the same. I may sing just as loud in the shower as I do here. But, but there's something special about when we get to come together and we get to praise together. And I hope you realize that. I hope that you get to enjoy that part of the Christian life when, when you get with other brothers and sisters in Christ and we can praise God together, not just by ourselves. We can do that all day, every day, all the time. But there is something different when we get to come together and we get to praise the Lord together. There's energy there. There's excitement there. There's, hey, I'm feeding off of you and you can feed off of me. And, and man, what do, I don't know what you've experienced this week in your relationship. And I don't know what you've experienced this week. And here's what I've experienced. And we gain from each other. This Tuesday night, we'll have our monthly men's meeting. And it's just an opportunity for men to come together because, hey, look, we've got jobs and we've got places to go and we've got families to feed and we've got all sorts of things. And <coughs> no offense, ladies, but sometimes we just need to come together as guys. Say, how's your week been? Well, been pretty, well, I was gonna say bad. been pretty bad. How's your week been? Well, not good. How things been? Not, not really, there, there's a time when we come together as men and, and we can we can praise the Lord together by sharing our lives together. And it's the same for this church, and it was the same that night th these angels showed up and they began to praise God and say, Glory to God in the highest. Praise is better when done together. And I hope you get to experience that. Again, not to keep pushing or harping on our candlelight service next Sunday night, but it's going to be an incredible service. And I hope you get to come and share and participate with us as we praise God together that night. The final point this morning is Christmas is for God's glory, not our indulgence. Verse 14 they begin to praise Him and they say, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And it's funny because when they were done and they went back to heaven, what did the, what did the shepherds do? They went back and began to tell everybody about what was happening. They began to tell everybody about what the message the angels had brought. And in verse 20 it says, The shepherds went back to their flocks doing what? Glorifying and praising God. Realize this, they weren't praising the shepherds that night. They weren't praising the angels that night. And to be honest with you, that night they weren't even praising the baby, the Messiah that had been born. They were praising God. All of this, everything about Christmas is for God's glory, not ours. 
It isn't about the new gadgets you can get for Christmas. It isn't about the gifts you can get. It isn't about how many times you can eat on Christmas Day. It isn't about any of the things that so often we flip in this Christmas season and we get caught up in this Christmas season. It's about God's glory. Why was the Messiah sent? Because it was part of God's plan, not your plan. It wasn't the shepherd's plan. It wasn't Mary's plan. It was God's plan to send a Savior. And this Messiah was sent so that we could honor and worship and send glory to God. It has nothing to do with Best Buy. I have down here, it has, has nothing to do with Best Buy, has nothing to do with a fat man in a red suit, has nothing to do about Rudolph or the Grinch, didn't have anything to do about Visa or PayPal, didn't have anything to do with Black Friday or Cyber Monday, didn't have anything to do with eggnog or Little Smokies. It has nothing to do with a partridge in a pear tree. Christmas is about God's glory. And folks, my hands raise first so often we miss it. And so often, we get caught up in the Christmas spirit, which is basically, let me just go see what I can get for me. Let me see what sale I can get. Let me see what gift I can get. Let me see what new gadget I can get. And we miss it. I found some other verses that talk about God's glory. John thirteen thirty two. it says, And since God receives glory because of the Son, He will receive His own glory. He will give His own glory to the Son. And he will do this at once. 1 Corinthians 10 speaks to us. It says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all. Why? For the glory of God. And, and I think, I, I, I know the scriptures are crafted intentionally. And I know God said exactly what he wanted to say right there. But he basically took it to the two simplest things you do every day. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Folks, so Christmas is about God's glory, not about us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, you see, we don't go around, this is, this is what Paul is saying, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made the light to shine in our hearts. Why? So we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, Christmas is all part of God's plan to expose us to Him and that person of that baby that grew up to be a man that grew up to die on the cross for your sins. Christmas is not about us and it's not about getting trapped in us. And so here's the question I had this week when I was boiling this down. What can you do this Christmas that shows the glory of God to others? Obviously, we can't go like the, uh, the shepherds did that night and go around telling everybody, man, these angels popped out of the, the sky and they came with this, there's a whole vast army of them and they were all singing and praising God and man, you should have been there. It was incredible. And I mean, we can't do that. What can we do in 2014? What can we do going in 2015 to give glory to God, to show the glory of God? And here's what I've come up with. I think the way that we show God's glory at Christmas time is telling him what this telling others what this holiday season means to us and why. Your coworker. You spend 8 hours a day, some 10 or 12 hours a day, 4 or 5 days a week with them. Unless they just started this week, you've probably been around them long enough to have built some sort of relationship. You know about them, they know about you. And maybe in your heart of hearts as a believer, maybe God's even sort of thumped your chest or pointed them out or said, you need to be telling them about me. And the best way you could 
talk about the glory of God at Christmas time is to go to someone and tell them why this season is important to you. Because this is the birth of your Savior. This is the birth of our Messiah. Our Deliverer. Without Him, we have no hope. Without Him, yeah, I need to be as depressed as the next person. Without Him, I need to be as, get past this season as everybody else. Without Him, I just need to be like, yeah, I, there's no reason to get excited during this time of year. Without Him. But because we have the Messiah, because the Messiah died for our sins, because we as believers, those of us who are believers, have accepted that, there's something to give glory to God about. Because hope has come alive. Just like last week when I told you that we're not doing some big church-wide project because I really believe God wants to use you individually and as families to speak to your hearts and to direct you and pass people along your way. And, I, and I've had some people that looked at me with blank stares last week when I announced it. I had a few people who sent me some emails going, I think you're right on target. And I know some of you heard it and just went, okay, good, I don't have to do anything this year. Some people just wrote it off. But the best way to give glory to God during this Christmas season is to share with others what God has done for us. And what this Christmas season really means to us as believers. Three questions for you as we wrap up. First one is this, who will you pray for this Christmas? Is there a co-worker, is there a family member is there a neighbor? Is there somebody you've been talking to? Maybe God has even put their finger on and said, man, you really need to reach out to those folks. You really need to, to, to talk to them, invite them, show them God's love. Somehow you need to do something to them. Begin by praying for those folks. Who will you pray for this Christmas? And I always tell people, remember this, someone prayed for you. Someone prayed for you. It could have been a grandmama. Could have been a mama, could have been a Sunday school teacher when you were getting drugged to Sunday school and you, you know, didn't think anything about it, but your Sunday school teacher was praying for you all week long. It could have been some pastor or youth pastor or, or children's worker. Somebody was praying for you and someone eventually told you about who Jesus was. And again, I don't know who that was in your life, but I know who it was in my life. And so, so often we forget that, hey, someone prayed for me, someone told me, someone cared for me, and I need to do the same for others. Second question is this, who will you invest in? Who will you invest in? You've heard this phrase, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Relationship is the key factor. In, in using God using us in other people's lives. And then the third question is, who would you invite? Who would you invite next Sunday night? And again, you may invite them and they may say, no, nah, I'm not interested. But at least you give them the option to say, no, nah, I'm not interested. And there's probably some of your co-workers and some of your family and some of your friends and some of the people you work with and around that are writing Facebook posts like the one I read this week. And there's probably people all around you that maybe even have the same attitude as the lady I talked to a couple of weeks ago. And there's probably people around you and in your life and in your circles that are just waiting for somebody to invite them to church. Will you be that person? Well, you guys, I look at these young guys sitting on the front row. I look at Colby. I look at Grace and Griffin. I look at these students. You guys have the biggest mission field in the world. Your school is bigger than most of these people's companies that any of these people work at. And you sit at lunch tables, and you hang out at ball games, and you crossfit, and you throw sling weights with people, and, and you go to movies with people, and you have people all around you. What will you do to impact those around you for Christ? What would God have us to do 
this Christmas season. Hope has come alive. And as hope comes alive for you and as hope comes alive for me, hope does not come alive so it can just sit still and sit stagnant in your life. God has never intended for His believers to be selfish. And so the whole attitude of I've got mine, I'm not worried about anybody else, goes completely contrary to Scripture and everything Jesus ever said in His Word. But we live in a country, I'm not going to say we live in a world, but we live in a country where many believers are very selfish. And as long as we've got our way to heaven, as long as we've got our faith, then we're not worried about anybody else. Folks, this is the time of year when the, when the gates are open and hearts are primed to hear about the hope of eternity, the hope of God. Let's pray. Father God, I